All right, so let's start here. Uh, get out of here. Okay, so last class we kind of left off looking at how we do hypothesis testing with proportions. We also looked at how we do that in Excel as well as sample means with a known population variance in Excel. So the last kind of type of hypothesis testing that we could have is going to be when we don't know the population variance. So the steps are going to be the exact same as when we had a sample mean where we knew the population variance or we knew the population variation. But if we don't know it, instead, we're going to just plug in or we we're using the population variance in our test statistic. We'll just plug in our sample variance. However, because we're using a sample variance, this will no longer represent a Z statistic or it won't be coming from a standard normal distribution. It now is going to be coming from the student T distribution. So now you can kind of think about, the, about this as we have kind of this broader term of test statistic before when we were looking at a proportion example or a sample mean where we knew the population variance, we were calling it a Z statistic because it came from the standard normal distribution. Now our test statistic, we are going to call a T stat, which are when we have a sample mean and only have a sample variance. But they're both, it's still a test statistic. We just call it a T stat instead of a Z stat because it identifies it comes from a student T distribution, not a standard normal. In fact, if we were going to keep going outside, I mean, we won't ever get to this point in this class, but if you took more stats courses, there's other things that we can do that involve needing an F stat, which is still a test statistic, but it comes from a F distribution, right? But we won't be using that. We just kind of have these two in this class, okay? So we have this T stat now or this test statistic that comes from a student T distribution. The only other thing is when we find critical values, we now need to know our degrees of freedom because every single degrees of freedom is essentially a different student T distribution, right? As we get to higher and higher degrees of freedom, our student T distribution starts to get more and more close to looking like a standard normal distribution, right? Or think about it as the variance gets closer and closer to one, right? Because our standard normal distribution had a variance of one, student T distributions slightly larger than one. Okay? But the steps, kind of the procedure of hypothesis testing, finding p-values, finding critical values, remains the same. It's just now we're using that student T table. Okay. So let's say we have this example where we want to test for whether or not the average home value in Muncie is different than ninety thousand. Okay. So we have a sample of 51 homes and we find that the average of those 51 homes is 85,000. We also find the sample variance from that sample is 100 million. What would the normal term hypothesis be? Well, what we're going to test for is whether or not the average monthly home price is different than 90,000. Okay? So anytime we see this word different than, we said we should be thinking about this as kind of a two-tailed test. Okay? Because saying that it's different than 95, sorry, 90,000 is really saying, is it any other value than 90,000 or is it not equal to 90,000? So what we want to find or what we want to test for is, is that true mean not equal to 90,000? So we assume the opposite is true, which is that it's equal to 90,000 and that becomes our null. Okay. So what type of tailed test do we have here? Well, if we have a not equal to sign, that's a two-tailed test. Right? The next thing we can do is find our critical values. Right? So I'm just going to kind of go through how we would find the critical value for an alpha of 0 0.01 first. Okay? I'm not having a ratio. So If we wanted a two-tailed test, we want our critical values. We're now looking at a student T distribution, okay? And we want, for a two-tailed test, we're going to have a pair of critical values. Okay? 
Now, before these critical values represented Z values because they were coming from a standard normal distribution, now they're just going to be T values because they're coming from a student T distribution. But there's still going to be the cutoff values that give us alpha total in the tails. Now, if we only have one tail, alpha is on one tail. When we have two tails, the area kind of in each of these tails will be half of alpha or alpha over two. So we want the T values, right? Those will be our, represent our critical values that give us alpha total in the tails or alpha over two in each one of these tails, right? So if my alpha is 0 0.01, 0 0.01 over two is 0 0.005. So I wanna find the value that gives me 0 0.005 in either that upper right tail or that kind of lower left tail. So I go to my standard normal distribution. Not, I don't know why I said that, sorry. Uh, I was, as we were doing that in the last class for some examples, right? I just got done saying, I need to use a student T distribution, right? Because I only have a sample variance. So the area I want in my tail is 0 0.005, but I forgot, I need to know my degrees of freedom as well. So if I had taken a sample of 51 homes, if we remember for confidence intervals, when we did this, to get my degrees of freedom, I simply take the sample size and do what? Remember for confidence intervals, we'll use the student T distribution as well. To get my degrees of freedom, I take my sample size and just subtract one. So if I had 51 homes, degrees of freedom would be 50. So I did the degrees of freedom of 50, and I want 0 0.005 in that upper tail. 2.678 would be the value that gives that to me. Okay. Any questions on that? Okay with that. Okay. So we just found these values. Or this value, I guess. 2.678, which if we remember, we have a two-tailed test. So I'm going to have a pair of critical values. Same value, one's negative, one's positive. Okay. So there's my critical values. I could think about where's my rejection region. Just kind of draw arrows into my tails there. Or anything more extreme or larger in absolute value. To kind of make my rejection decision, the next thing I'm going to need is what? Got my rejection regions. What do I need to see if it falls in that region? So my null hypothesis, right, is when I'm trying to reject or fail to reject. The p-value approach, I can find my p-value and compare it to alpha to make my rejection decision. With the critical value approach, I can find my critical values and compare that to my test statistic, right? Before it was a z-statistic, now we'll compare it to our t-statistic coming from a student t-distribution. So, <coughs> excuse me. So we have kind of the critical value for the 1% level there. And I'll talk about the other two values here in just a second. So I'm not ignoring them completely. I just want to walk through it for this one first. We can find them from the table. I already walked you through that. How would I find this test statistic? Well, I've got my sample mean. I've got my assumed true mean, sample size, and my sample variance. I have this equation. You'll have this in the exam. You'll have a formula sheet. But it's the same equation we were using before to find our test statistic for a sample mean. It's just now instead of a population variance, we have only have a sample variance. But once I plug the numbers in, it looks no different, all right? Same format. So we had a test statistic of negative 3.57. And really at this point, I mean, this is, once we identify the formula we need, it's just a matter of plugging and chugging, right? We are given all this information. So negative 3.57. So if we plot that test statistic, Or our t statistic from a student t distribution, we can see here it's clearly in the rejection region. And when I'm plotting this, I'm just plotting it as though it's a number line, right? Negative 3.5 is going to be plotted, you know, it's less than to the left of negative 2.678. So here we definitely reject, and it was when alpha was 0 0.01, so we reject at the 1% significance level, or said differently, with 99% confidence. Well, if I can reject it with 99% confidence, I for sure know I can reject it with 95 and 
right? Because those are just a lower level of confidence. If I can say something with 99% confidence, for sure I can say it with 90, right? So how could I kind of prove my, that to myself? Well, if I think about what my other two critical values would be, kind of pairs of critical values for this two-tailed test, notice if I think about the alpha values of 0 0.1, 0 0.05, and 0 0.01, well, for this two-tailed test, to find my critical values, I had to divide alpha by two. So those alpha values divided by two would be 0 0.05, 0 0.025, and 0 0.005. Well, if those are all three here in my table, I just go down to my degrees of freedom. I find at the 90% level, it's 1.676. 95% would be 2.009. And then the one we already looked up, the 1% significance level was 2.678. Right? So that's how I could pretty quickly find all three pairs of critical values for these three different significance levels. Okay. Questions on that? So I already did this test, critical value approach, at that 1%. And we said, well, if we, do it, if we can reject it with 99% confidence, the other two don't matter. Well, okay, but we could show what if we had done it, we'd make the same decision, right? So my other Critical values were what? Negative 2.009 and negative 1.6 something, right? Which doesn't really matter because if I draw my rejection regions, well, very clearly that test statistic is going to be in the rejection region for both those lower levels as well. Right? So, you know, we, we kind of tested it at the highest level. And in this case, we could reject it at every single one of these significance levels, right? <coughs> And I didn't plot them because I don't have a lot of room, but right, you would also plot your positive critical values since we have pairs for a two-tailed test. Okay. okay. Any questions on that? Okay. So what if instead of doing the critical value approach, I wanted to do my p-value approach? So Draw this one slightly differently. So we know that this was going to be centered around 90,000. And we found a sample mean of 85,000, right? So for a two tailed test, the p value is the probability I found the sample evidence that I did that was as far away from the assumed true value or anything further that went against the null. Or the one-tailed test, we only had to worry about one side, but with this one, I only see one sample mean, but it would have been equally as likely for me to find a sample mean of 95,000. And the thing is, if I had seen that, that would have also been evidence that went against the null, because now the null is just that it's equal to this one value. So for a two-tailed test, my p-value is going to be split up on two sides of that distribution. So I see this is my sample mean, that 85,000. I can turn that into a test statistic. Right? I can find the area to the left of that test statistic. Oops. But then I'm going to have to remember I have a two-tailed test, so I have the exact same area on the other side. So once I find this area, excuse me, I have to multiply by two. Now, if I try to do this using the student T tables or the T tables, my degrees of freedom is 50, right? So, and I found, what was it? Negative 3.57 was my test statistic. So, I go to that T table, degrees of freedom of 50, do I see my test statistic anywhere here? Well, no, there's only six test statistics. Mine was negative 3.57. In fact, I don't see any negative values here. Well, remember, the student T table is set up to us to show us the kind of right side of the distribution. So what we really could think about is all these numbers would exist if instead we were thinking about the left side of the distribution, the same areas would apply, it's just that all these would be negative. So even if I was looking for negative 
when I go to the table, I, I need to be looking for just 3.57. We're gonna think about, you're using that student T table to choose the absolute value of your test statistic, okay? Well, even if I do that, I still don't see positive 3.57, right? Well, and that's because of what this is telling me is the area to the left, or, or kind of, sorry, to the area to the right of positive 2.678 is 0 0.005, right? So, what I know is that in my test statistic is 2.57, 2.678, the area to the left of negative 2.678, that was the last value on the table there, was 0 0.005. So this area is 0 0.005. If I want the area to the left of negative 3.57, that's going to be something that is smaller, right? So all I can really say, oh, I should have been using a different color. All I can really say is that the area to the left of my test statistic has to be something less than 0 0.005, right? Which means I also know the area over here on the other side for my two-tailed test is also less than 0 0.005. So if the total area in these tails represents my p-value, I can't get an exact value here, but I can put a bound on it, right? If I know that each of these areas are, is less than 0 0.005, I know the total area is less than what? If this has to be less than 0 0.005, this has to be less than 0 0.005, the total area has to be less than one. 0 0.01, yeah. Because think about what could fit this criteria. 0 0.004999. Well, even if I had two areas that were 0 0.004999, I still wouldn't get past 0 0.01, right? And then anything below that, it's going to be even further below 0 0.01. Or I could just treat this like I would any other problem and just multiply my p-value by two. But now because I have a bound on it, well, I would just say instead of being less than 0 0.005, it's out of the way. It'd be less than 0 0.005 times two or less than 0 0.01. Right? So with the student T table, if we want to do the p-value approach, sometimes all we can do is put a bound or a bounds on that p-value. Right? Here, we, could, we can't say it's equal to a specific value, but we can say it's less than 0 0.01. Any questions on that? So on, on like the exam or something like on the exams, I won't ask you to kind of find these unless I give you numbers that give you one of these values, you know, explicitly. Like let's say that problem had worked out to be 2.009. You could then find the area to, to the right of that, right? Um, now on the, on the homework, the connect homework, there are a few problems where it asks you to bound these. So for example, let's say my degrees of freedom was 40. I found a test statistic of, let's say 1.9. Well, that's in between these two values. So I know the area to the right of 1.9 has to be somewhere between 0 0.05 and 0 0.025, right? So on the home, Connect homework, um, there are a few where you have to kind of figure out what the p-value is and you're only gonna be able to kind of bound it. On the exam, I'll give you specific values from this table. If I ever ask you to find a p-value from an example of the student T distribution, okay? All right, um, I think I had one more example, yeah. So let's say we had some of this birth data and we wanna test the hypothesis that the Indiana, weight of Indiana uh, babies is less than the national average. So what I wanna test for is whether or not Indiana's mean is less than 3,287. So what I want to test for is my alternative hypothesis, so less than that national average. I'll assume the opposite is true, which is that it's greater than or equal to that national average. What type of tailed test do I have here? Look at the alternative hypothesis, less than or left tailed test, okay? So I've got a left tailed test. Right away, which of these do I know has to be my critical values for the one, five, and 10% level? It's a left-tailed test. 
Oh, yeah, my critical values are going to be on the left side of that T distribution, right? So I think someone said it, by the way, if you unzoom your own video, you can said someone said B, right? Which is correct. Our critical values have to be negative because if I'm looking at that T distribution, remember it's still centered around zero. So for a left tail test, if I want the critical value that gives me alpha in this lower left tail, and alpha is relatively small, right? Something less than 0.5, I'm always going to find negative values there. Right? So I have to look up the first one. So 0 0.01 are the first alpha values. Well, I go to my student T table. Now it's a little easier because alpha is all in that lower left tail. So 0 0.01 at degrees of freedom of 50, 2.403. Right? So 2.403 is the area that I want in that lower left tail. Actually, I feel like. Oh, because I'm looking at the wrong. Okay, different example. My degrees of freedom is at 50 here. What's my sample size? So my degrees of freedom is really high, right? So if I go to my table, not that was the last example is 50. I actually start to get some pretty big jumps here. So if my degrees of freedom is 399, I'm going to choose the, the value that's closest to that. Now in Excel, we don't have this problem. We can use any degrees of freedom we want. In fact, if I look here at 500, anything over 100 really, notice if I go to that column where it's 0 0.01 in that, that tail, all these values, if I round kind of after 100, if I round into the second decimal, 2.33. So this is where we said any sample size over 100, the standard normal distribution would be a good approximation for the student T. Sorry, yeah, for the student T. Um, so even if we use 500 though here, and we don't use the standard normal to approximate, we just use the degrees of freedom closest to the one that we found, about 2.33 if we round to the second decimal. What if we wanted alpha of 0 0.05 or 0 0.1 in the tail? Well, we just go down these columns, 1.28 and 1.65. But notice the second decimal, the standard normal values would actually round to the same thing, right? So to the second decimal point, a degrees of freedom of 399 is no different than the values you would find with a standard normal distribution. Right? But if we did look those up, right, we would find these three values. Now on the table, they were all positive, but remember, that student T table only looks at this upper right tail. For a left tail test, we had the left side or the left tail. Well, it's the exact same values that would give us these areas in the tail, just negative, right? To the left of that mean of zero. So our critical values will be negative 2.33, negative 1.65, and negative 1.28. Okay. So we can draw our critical values in our rejection region here. So the values that I want here, the bag marker, I think. Okay. So I've got about negative 1.29, it might have been 1.28, but you get the idea. It doesn't change it a whole lot. My rejection regions, anything kind of to the left of those critical values. The last thing I need to do is figure out what my test statistic is, plot my test statistic and see if it's in those rejection regions. So I go to that equation I have for my test statistic, plug everything in, I get negative 4.6. Now, one thing I wanted to point out here, right, is how do I know I can rule some things out here? Well, if I'm calculating a test statistic, it still represents the number of standard deviations away from the assumed true mean. Well, if I find a sample mean below the assumed true mean, the number of standard deviations away I'm going to be will be negative, right? Because I'm below. So I automatically know my test statistic here because I found a sample mean that's less than the assumed true mean. I know that that, sam uh, that sample mean will translate to a test statistic that is negative. 
because it was below the assumed true mean. If I found sample evidence that was above the assumed true mean, then I know my test statistic would be positive. Okay? So we know it's going to be negative. Like I said, once we identify the test statistic equation we need to be using, though, it's just a matter of plugging and chugging, right? Our sample mean, our, sam or our assumed true mean, our sample variance, and our sample size. So we get a test statistic of negative 4.6. Right? That's pretty large. Anytime you see a test, like the last example, we had a test statistic of negative 3.5, and we were able to reject at the 99% level. A test statistic of negative 4.6 is, is even larger, right? Pretty far away from that assumed true value. Well, the further, like, right, the more standard deviation, oh, what did I do? The more standard deviations away we get from that assumed true value, the less likely it is that we would see that value for a sample mean, which would mean that it's even less likely that what we assume to be true was in fact the true mean. So if I have a test statistic of negative 4.9, right, I mean, that's actually, let me get, grab the, the red one. If I plot negative 4.9, right, that's somewhere way out there in my rejection region, right? And if I think about what's the area to the left of negative 4.9, it's going to be pretty close to what? If I think about the p-value, right, which would be the left tail test, the area to the left of 4.9, that p value is going to be pretty close to what value? Zero. Zero, right? Think about this. If I looked at this degrees of freedom that we're using a 500, the area to the left of 2.586, or sorry, this would be the area to the right, right? The table set up so it's the area to the right. So the area to the right of 0.2586 is 0 0.005, which also means the area to the left of negative 2.586 is 0 0.005. So if the area to the left of negative 2.56 maybe it was eight, six. If this area is 0 0.005, negative 4.9, the area to the left of negative 4.9 is going to be even smaller, right? Or even closer to zero. Okay. So if we wanted to find the p-value here, the p-value would be approximately zero, right? So the p-value of approximately zero I only reject if it's less than alpha. Is my p-value going to be less than alpha at the 99% level? Well, if it's pretty much zero, then yeah, it's going to be less than 0 0.01, which means I strongly can reject using the p-value approach. But notice my test statistic was really far into my rejection region as well. So both ways kind of show me evidence that, yeah, you can reject this with a very high level of confidence. Any other questions on that before we kind of keep going? Okay with this? All right. Um, let's see. All right. Well, these are slides for next class. So actually, we're going to go and do some of this in Excel. Oh, why did I? Oh, I opened the wrong, wrong sections. Hold on. Section five, here we go. So let's keep working with that hypothesis testing blank file. We'll go to the unknown population variance worksheet here. Uh, let's change the view so you guys can see it. All right. So I had this data on the e-cigarettes, and here I have the age that the person first tried an e-cigarette. This one is very alarming, the first observation of nine, but the other ones make a little bit more sense. I think there's some really crazy, yeah, there's a couple nines in here. Anyways, so that's, that's problematic. But if I want to do a test, and I think in the slides where I have the Excel kind of help summarize, summarized files, 
uh, I said, we want to test for whether or not the tr true population mean for the age that someone first tried an e-cigarette is different than 15. So we're going to do a two-tailed test again. So I can find my sample mean. So I'm just going to take the average of that age they first tried an e-cigarette variable. I can find my sample variance. I wasn't given a population variance, so I'll find my sample variance for that variable. And I gave you a sample size of 30 here at first, just to kind of show you some things. Obviously, we have a way larger sample si sample here, um, but let's assume it was only of, of size 30. We then had this value that we assumed was true, which was 15. We're gonna assume that the true average age was equal to 15, or the true population mean age was 15. And we're going to see if we can reject that or fail to reject it. So I put alpha here as well. We're going to do this at a 99% level, so an alpha of 0.01. So we're going to go, we're going to look at this test statistic equation. And the first thing we're going to do is basically just use Excel, enter this formula in to be our calculator, right? So we're going to put that formula into Excel, which is take my sample mean, which is here, Subtract the assumed true mean, which is over here. Okay? Divide that by the square root of my sample variance divided by my sample size. Okay? Now, one thing I saw with some of the problems, uh, some of the homework threes, is if you were using that student t distribution for the confidence intervals, you sometimes were dividing by your degrees of freedom. In the test statistic equations and confidence intervals, you still like use your sample size when you're using n. The only place that you use your degrees of freedom is when you go to that table to look up a t value, right? So I've got my test statistic on negative 2.2. What's my p value? So if it's a two tailed test, let me think about what this looks like visually. So this two tailed test, I've got student t distribution, I just found a test statistic of negative 2.2. The probability I saw something 2.2 standard deviations away from the assumed true mean or even further, and that was evidence that went against my null hypothesis. Well, if it's a two-tailed test, it would have been equally as likely for me to see something 2.2 standard deviations above. So I can find the area to the left of my test statistic, but then to get my total p-value, I'm going to have to multiply it by 2. Right, similar to the other problem that we worked through. Right. So how do I find the area to the left of my test statistic? Well, if we can look back at what we did last class. When we had a known population variance, we calculated our test statistic. We used the norm.s.dist. Right. Well, here we're not using the standard normal distribution. We're using the t distribution, so t.dist. It's going to be the formula that, or the function that we want to use. We tell it what our test statistic is, comma, our degrees of freedom, so our sample size minus one, comma, this third thing, we always put a one here. And what that will do is tell me the area to the left of my test statistic. Now, we said it was a two tailed test, so what else did I need to do here? not divide by two, multiply. multiply by two. When I'm looking up my critical values, then I divide my alpha by two. Okay. Now, one thing I wanna make sure people are aware of, um, cause I saw a couple people use it incorrectly uh, in the Excel assignment. This last thing where it's like cumulative, that's always a one. I, I know I said that before, but it's always a one. It tells you the area to the left. If I put a zero in there or put in false, it doesn't tell me the area to the right. It'd be nice if it did that. I mean, it'd be very nice if they programmed it so you had that option to do that. But, you know, if I put a zero in there, like I said, what it's really trying to do is like take a narrow range around the value that you're looking for and return that to you, but it's not, it's not useful for what we're doing, right? So always kind of use a one there. It'll tell you the area to the left, okay? So we get our p-value. Um, there's another way you can do this, and I honestly think it kind of is more complicated. So I'll show it to you, but you don't have to use it. And I, you know, I don't love, love it, but it's another function in Excel. So 
t.dist.2t. So what that's telling it is it's a two-tailed test, right? And you're wanting to find a value. Sorry, you're wanting to tell it a value for the test statistic. It will find the area that's more extreme than that test statistic, multiply it by two, and then spit back out at you the p-values. Right? Well, there's one problem with this, this function, right? It works very similar to the table, right? So if I try to tell it my test statistic, and what I think it's gonna do is, okay, it's gonna find the area to the left of that test statistic, comma, tell it my degrees of freedom. What I would hope this would do is look up the area to the left of my test statistic, multiply it by two, and then that would be my p-value, right? Problem is it, it won't do that, right? And the reason why is because however this formula, you know, this, this function is written behind the scenes, it can only take positive values for this first argument. Right? So I have to take the absolute value, which is okay, because this is a symmetric distribution. So the area to the left of negative 2.2 will be the same as the area to the right of positive 2.22. So this t.dist.2t uh, function, like this, the, the physical tables, only looks at kind of that right side of the distribution. So now if I hit enter here, sure enough, I got the same p-value that I, I calculated using the other approach. Right? So whatever's easiest for you to think about, um, if you have a positive test statistic, obviously you don't have to take the absolute value here for two-tailed tests, and that makes it kind of easy, um, but two different ways of, of doing the same thing in Excel. So if I now have my p-value, just like last class, I can use that if statement to really put in words if I wanted to. Now I could just like look at this and say, okay, 0 0.03 is not less than my alpha of 0 0.01. So I'm gonna to fail to reject. What I'm really doing is I know the hard and fast rule is if my p-value is less than alpha, if that's true, put in the word reject. If that's false, comma, put in fail to reject. So that's just gonna check it for me and, and kind of put words out there, right? So I fail to reject alpha, or sorry, I failed to reject alpha. I failed to reject the null hypothesis at the given alpha, right? I could change this, if I change the point one, well now our rejection decision should be to reject, right? Because our p-value is less than alpha of point one. But the original kind of setup we had here was the 99% confidence level. So what if I wanted to find the critical values? Well, the critical values we said was the values on this distribution that give me alpha total in my tails. I only have one tail, all of alpha's in my tail. Here I've got, I've got alpha over two on in each tail. And I want to find the critical values that would give me alpha over two in each tail. Okay. Now I know that for a two-tailed test, I'll have a pair of critical values here. So what is my alpha? I believe we're doing 0 0.01. If I know the area I want in my tail and I want to work backwards and you know tell Excel the area I want in the tail and have it spit back out at me now a T value, the last class. When we're dealing with the standard normal distribution, we use that norm.s.inv. Now we're doing the student t distribution, so t.inv. The area I want in my tail, well, I have two tails now. So t.inv kind of uses that, just like norm.s.inv, uses that lower left tail. So I'll tell it alpha divided by two, comma, what's my degrees of freedom? My sample size minus one. This should give me my critical value on the left side, so negative 2.75. For a two-tailed test, right, I have a pair of critical values. So I just found negative 2.7. I know I have the same critical value on the right side, but positive. So a good way to indicate that, just right next to it, take the absolute value of whatever you found, you know, the value, but, but negative, right? So I've got a pair of critical values here. Okay, any questions over any of that? Do you want to see another cell again or? Okay. No, I could also do my rejection decision here using the critical value approach. Now, 
work through, you know, you can draw this out and for left tail test, you know, for your test statistic mean and rejection region, you would have to find something that a test statistic to the left or less than. But if it was a positive test statistic, you have to be like greater than. So how can I solve this so I could always do this the same way, no matter if it's a left tailed, right tailed, two tailed test. And I think I said this last class, it might have been last Friday, but I think it was on Monday. If I take the absolute value of my test statistic and the absolute value of my critical value, I'll always be checking to see is my test statistic more extreme. So take the absolute value of my test statistic. If it's more extreme or greater than an absolute value, my critical values, comma, if that's true, I should be rejecting, comma, if not, I should be failing to reject. So if I take the absolute values of my test statistic and my critical value, doesn't matter if I'm doing a left tail test, right tail test, two tail test, once I take the absolute value, I'm just saying, is the absolute value of the test statistic greater than the absolute value of my critical value? If it is, I reject. If not, I fail to reject. Sure enough, right? Here, negative 2.2 would not be in my rejection region. It wouldn't be as extreme as negative 2.7, so I fail to reject. But if I change this to maybe 0.1, well now negative 2.2 is to the left or more extreme than my critical value, and so I should be rejecting. Okay. Excuse me. So critical value, p-value approach, either one, we can we you know can make these rejection decisions. Now we started with a sample size of 30. I have a much larger sample. What I want to point out here is even seeing a value pretty close to that assumed true mean of 15, right? It's only 0.8 away. I couldn't reject that as the actual true value, true population mean at the 99% level with a sample size of 30. Now notice if I have a really large sample, so I just take the count of the actual data I have that I was calculating the sample mean from, notice on the same, right, same sample mean, so same distance away from that hypothesized true mean, but because having a higher sample size will greatly reduce the variance of my sample means, I know that if whatever sample mean I see, it'll be very, very likely it's very close to the true population mean. So now notice that this would actually be 32 standard deviations. The sample mean I found is 32 standard deviations away from that assumed true mean, which probably means I made the wrong assumption. It probably isn't that value. The true mean probably isn't 15. Sure enough, you can look at the p-value. I don't remember if this got mentioned last class or not. It might have been a different section. When I see e to the negative 217, that means take 8 and move the decimal point to the left 217 places. So this is essentially 0. This p-value is basically 0. Right? I can clearly reject here at the 99% level. In fact, I can start to say, based off the sample evidence I found, with a sample size this large, I could reject 14 and a half as the, as the true kind of population mean starting age that someone smokes an e-cig. I can do 14.3. I can still reject it, right? So I can really narrow down, like, what are potential values for this, this true mean to be based off the sample mean that I found, right? Or I can reject a lot more values when I have a higher sample size. That might be a different way to say it, okay? Um, any questions over any of that? Okay. Um, we'll do type two errors next class. I wanna do a little bit of type two error thing. I'll show you. Well, we might just end early today. I think I might save some of this stuff for, on, for, for uh, Friday. So basically, Friday, um, we're just going to go through more practice problems. I'm going to do some board work and kind of hopefully give, um, kind of reinforce our understanding of what's going on with hypothesis testing. We're going to go back to discuss type 2 errors a little bit. We're going to kind of review type 1 errors. Um, I'm going to show you something in Excel that's kind of a a thought exercise in improving to ourselves what type one errors are and what we're really doing with this hypothesis testing. But like I said, we'll also get some more practice with some 
you know, some problems that have some actual values, kind of working through them. You know, the way I have it, you know, we have a lot, you know, we have Friday and really all of next week to like, like just keep going through examples of hypothesis testing, also do a little bit of review. So I'll get those practice exams for that second um, midterm talk as well. So we'll start to go through some questions from there. Um, the next couple class periods, I want to focus mainly on hypothesis testing. If you have any questions over, over any of the hypothesis testing problems that you see on those practice exams or anything that we've done, um, the next week, probably like Wednesday and Friday, we're going to reserve for asking a lot of those questions. Okay. And then, you know, if we don't have questions, I'll have more problems we can kind of walk through and get, get, get just, just more practice with. Questions before we get out of here today? Okay. All right. I will see you guys on.